And so it is our belief as Muslims, and many historians also take this, concept, this belief, that when you look at the religions from the beginning of time, we have to recognize that there was a constant struggle going on between those who believed in one God and those who believed in many gods. This struggle has always existed with human life. We find it more intense at different points in time. But what is important for us to understand is that in America today, we are sort of a hodgepodge, uh, melted down mixture of hundreds of cultures. And we call it American, or we call it Canadian. But nobody is really sure what it actually means. And now that we're going into the 21st century, it is important for us to be able to um, uh, separate the different elements within that culture and to recognize the roles that these elements play. In this struggle that went on from the early days of human life, there were people who put their worship in the natural world. And so those natural objects that were around them that appeared to be the strongest objects, they would worship through those objects. So in other words, if, you, if people living in desert areas, in many of these areas you find a huge rock or a huge tree. And so many people would worship the tree or the rock, or, the, or they felt they would worship the cosmic forces through that tree or through that rock. In some countries that had large rivers, such as those who lived around the Nile in the Nile Valley, or in the Niger River, or the Congo River, or the Amazon, those who lived around these powerful forces of water, we find that religion was developed around the river. And in many cases, people would worship manifestations of the river, even some of the animals from the river itself, hoping to appease the power and the forces in the river itself. Probably the most common form of worship in the ancient world was the worship of the sun. And that is for obvious reasons. The sun is obviously the largest of all of creation. And that when the sun comes out, the power of the sun, it gives light after darkness. It gives heat in the cold weather. It brings forth the, light, uh, the life from plants. And so the sun itself, in a sense, is a life-giving form and so those who were trying to figure out what is the source of our life, what is the source of the living beings around us, focused on the sun as the main object and developed within their religions a concept based upon the sun. And so we find this concept in all parts of the world. Contrary to some of the beliefs of people, it was even very strong in Europe. I mean, up until now, we still count, we still have during our week, at the end of our week, we have Saturday and then we have Sunday, which is the day of the sun. And this is a concept that they used to have. And what is important for us to understand, especially when we're dealing with young people who, who, who tend to be caught up just in images coming at them, that the images within many of the holidays that we have have got a number of streams and especially you could say two main streams that are coming in. There is a stream of monotheism and there is a stream of polytheism, of those who worship many gods and those especially who focused on the sun god. In the winter season, around December 25th, the people celebrated uh, the winter solstice. And those of you who have lived in the north, I'm coming from Toronto, Canada, there's four seasons, not two or three like you have here. There's four seasons. And these four seasons in Canada are very distinct seasons, although El, El Nino and La Nina are changing that also. But they're very distinct seasons. And so within these seasons, there are certain high points or low points. And the solstice time is the time when you, the essence of the season comes about. And so the winter solstice would come about um, somewhere between um, December, in, in December, from December 21st, 
and it goes all the way to around January 6th or so. And so the people of the North would celebrate uh, different uh, holidays, have different occasions based upon the winter solstice. Put yourself in the northern countries. I went to Norway and spent some time with the Muslims in Oslo. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them. They're really far up north. And also I had the chance to go to Alaska and there's Muslims in Alaska. Now when we were there um, in the summertime and it was time for Salat al-Maghrib and we looked outside and the sun was still out. Somebody looked at his watch and he said, well, that's sunset and it's time to make Maghrib. So we made Salat al-Maghrib that is normally made with the sunset according to the watch and the sun was out. The time for Isha, they looked at their watch again. It's supposed to be darkness of night according to the fiqh. They looked at their watch and they said, it's time for Isha. We made Isha and the sun was out. Around one o'clock at night, I looked at my watch and realized it's time to go to bed, but the sun was out. And so in, in those parts of the world, you are in a situation where, for the Muslims, you make taqdeer. And the fuqaha have told us that you can use the closest reasonable uh, uh, city for your base, or you can use Mecca al Mukarramah. And some different uh, fuqaha have used different positions. Where I was, they used Seattle, Washington. Uh, as the base of their um, uh, time where they were in Alaska. What is important though is that in the winter time there is a period where there is no light. You are literally in darkness 24 hours of the day. And this stretches f for a period of time. Now could you imagine if you're living in Alaska or living in Canada or living in Norway and you don't have central heating and the cold is outside it's darkness around you. People are dying from disease. It's a terrible time and, and every family would probably lose somebody or they would know of somebody dying from the cold and disease during that season. This is the winter solstice. And so when the sun starts to come out, the people now are looking at the sun as a life-giving force. And so during that time, a number of ceremonies were held in northern countries. In um, the far north was the Feast of the Twelve Nights, which stretched from December 25th to January 6th. Also in ancient Greece, there was the Bacchanalia, which was held for their god Bacchus, the god of wine and sport and play. The Romans had the Saturnalia for their god Saturn, their main sun god Saturn. And so you find during these times that the people held ceremonies in the north, they would burn uh, bonfires. The light was important, the fire, because the fire represents the light, the life-giving force for those who worship nature. Also in the north, they recognized that there was one tree that even that despite the cold would still remain alive. The evergreen, the, the evergreen tree, the fir tree. And so in some cases they would take this fir tree, believing that there was powers of life within the tree, and they would put it in homes, set it there and put a light on the top of it, or burn them in the front, or they would make uh, 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 mistletoes and put them over their doorways, a type of what we would call ta'wiz or tamima. It is an amulet. And they would hang the amulet over their doors hang the amulets in their home, hoping that this fir tree, that this so-called life-giving force would protect them from the danger of the winter. And so their ceremonies developed around this. And this went on for hundreds of years. We also find in the ancient uh, northern countries, we find the Druids and the Druids of the north and they carried out special ceremonies surrounding the mistletoe and surrounding the fir tree and the beliefs and, and they would meet within circular areas and they had a secretive cult that spread throughout the far northern countries. One of the interesting individuals, and you can look this up 
if you can find it in the dictionaries or encyclopedias, is a man called Mithra or Mithras. This is a very mysterious character. And when you look at history, you find that this uh, individual called Mithra was born on December 25th. His day of the week was the seventh day of the week that we still call Sunday. He was supposed to be the son of the, of the sun god himself, and they had a special sacrament made up of bread and wine, and they would make this drink during this time, and supposedly he died for the sins of the people. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? 